It's uh, at least uh, 703 or 705. Let's call the meeting to order. And the agenda looks rather brief. I'm glad you're here, Alyssa. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I know these are crazy times. <laughs> um, but in any case, um, we have no appointments, no hearings. We have minutes. Um, what are the committee's thoughts on the minutes? You have to read something to bring the meeting to order. You want to do that? I think you oh. did. Yeah, I think it's 7.05 you did. OK. All right. Sorry. I breezed through that part. Sorry. OK. <laughs> I thought there was something official that you actually had to say. Nah. OK. So so we're on to the minutes now. Um, are there any suggestions or changes? I, I had a couple. Um, oh, I read through them, but I didn't find anything in particular. Yeah, yeah this is not serious, super serious. Um, but Betsy, if you could, do you have the minutes near you, Betsy? I do. All right. Um, about four paragraphs down into the, uh, the first public hearing. Mm -hmm. Mr. Saucier explained that the electronic design plan, um, it's a little confusing, but using electronic, why don't you just get rid of it and simply say the design plan was received. Mm -hmm. Got it. Uh, and the rest of the stuff isn't that important. So unless anybody else has any suggestions, is there a motion to approve? I make a motion to approve them. Minutes of December 15th, 2020. Thank you, I second that motion. Thank you, Arlene. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. So that takes us to new and old business. Number one, old business, COVID-19 updates. So there's been a lot. Um, Alyssa. Um, there are so many things to talk about on this topic. Where would you like to start, or you want me to start? Um, I just wanted to make sure my Siri did start talking to me. Okay, perfect. Um, well, I have some good news. We had a wonderful uh, first responder clinic last week. Uh, yes. It was. Yeah, it was wonderful. We treated it like a EDS drill. Mm -hmm. um, we were quite happy with the results. Um, really well run. This is my colleague, Simone. She just signed on. Hello. Hello. Simone. Uh, my partner in crime here. Um, and, you know, Simone and I had the chance to attend another uh, first responder clinic over the weekend. And I, I got to say that um, our Norfolk first responder clinic was just hands down. So I think that we have a lot to be proud of. Awesome. That's great. That's great to hear. Who was involved in the organization of that uh, clinic? Who was involved? Who was involved? Yeah. I mean, just, just to sort of shout out to the folks who did such a great job. Who, who was involved in organizing the clinic? Well, myself and Simone. <laughs> All right, guys. That, that's first two. Yep. Uh, Betsy, of course. Mm -hmm. And then we had um, Chief Stone and uh, Chief Kenny as well. I'm trying to remember. Is there anybody else? Yeah. So our our facilities um, our facilities team was great. They were able to. Um, deliver all my supplies down to the, we held it at the uh, police station down on Sharon Ave. So they delivered all of the supplies and um, helped set everything up and um, stored then afterwards stored everything for me. So nice. Who, who supplied the, uh, the vaccine? So we worked in conjunction uh, with Foxborough um, they served as the dispensing site and, um, last minute, uh, Millis was able to provide us with an additional 10 doses. 
Okay. Did you have just specific number of doses for the specific number of people that had signed up to do it? There wasn't extra doses that you returned back to either Foxborough Millis or anything like that? No, we wanted to ensure per state guidelines that um, anybody who, that we of course vaccinated our first responders, but that we also covered our volunteers. Mm -hmm. So all, all told, approximately 60 doses were uh, dispensed that day. Is that the number? Yep, that's correct. Okay. And we used every every last dose. Awesome. <laughs> Any oh. plans to utilize um, some of the other groups, like the Medical Reserve Corps or something, to help you guys do more vaccinations for more people in towns? So I think we're trying to get through phase one. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure you guys are well aware um, the rollout is not ideal, mm -hmm. uh, to say the least. So I think, you know, we're just trying to go pretty much day by day, um, put one foot in front of the other mm -hmm. um, based upon what the state is telling us to do, because, you know, the state just um, was allocated pretty much 80% um, less, uh, only 80% yeah. of what we um, were allocated. Yeah. That's what we received. Mm -hmm. yeah, speaking of rollout, I have, a, I have a question for you, actually. I guess this is to Betsy or Alyssa. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I thought I saw Norfolk's name along with about half a dozen other towns as collaborating with, with uh, Foxborough. And, and then a few days later, I saw you know, images on Channel 5 News of the Foxborough guys actually being injected over at uh, Gillette Stadium. But then I discovered that our people were actually, you know, getting their injections here at, on Sharon Ann. Had there been a change in the way that whole organization started and then went off in different directions? So I think, you know, Foxborough acted as the dispensing site Mm -hmm. So they received the vaccine, so they put the initial order in and then uh, dispensed the vaccine to the local jurisdictions. Ah, uh, okay. So the, the numbers that are being dispensed locally then were a lot less than the original, whatever the number was, because they, they were saying you had to have 200 people present to have a clinic, but we had less than that by far. Exactly, and so that's why um, the state recommended that local juris jurisdictions collaborate. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one nice. jurisdiction placed the order. Okay. Well, um, congratulations. So, so this did that cover all of the first responders for the town? Yep, we have a couple stragglers, um, <laughs> and we're <laughs> we're working <laughs> with the chief. Um, try to see how we can vaccinate them, um, hopefully within the next week or so. Good. Okay. All right. Well, congratulations. I'm glad it went as well as it did. And yeah, the, the idea of, of collaborating with the, uh, the uh, medical group would be a, a great way mm -hmm. to, you know, add to the number of boots on the ground, as they say, if, if we could use the extra help. Um, so what's, what's going to happen next then in terms of vaccinations? Um, so in terms of vaccinations, <clears throat> um, well, of course, we need to get uh, the rest of our stragglers vaccinated. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, I know that there's some, you know, there's some <clears throat> possible um, individuals over at the Council on Aging that we're trying to see if we can vaccinate them. Um, and then once we're finished with phase one, then, you know, I think that we'll have to have a conversation about phase two um, and see where we want to go. Um, there's just a lot right now with, I'm not sure if you guys are aware of prep mod. Are you aware? I know Betsy, you're a, you know what prep mod is, but so prep mod is something that the state has rolled out, and it's kind of like an electronic health record for public health. Um, 
And so the state is really pushing us to use prep mod because it's a way for us to bill for the vaccine as well for the administration and not for the vaccine, but for the administration. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the VNA doesn't have access for um, with prep for prep mod right now. That's up to the local boards of health. They didn't send VNA um, an invitation. Um, and prep mod, the platform has a lot of bugs in it. So it's really difficult to execute large scale clinics um, the way that the state wants you to by utilizing prep mod because it has these bugs. So right now, you know, if we wanted to try to execute phase two and three clinics as the state wants us to, we have to get our hands wet with prep mod. So there's just a lot of logistics that we need to start to kind of tackle before we decide how we want to move forward with vaccinations. So how can we help you with that if we can? Um, That's kind of up to you. Hi, I'm Simone, everyone. Nice <laughs> to meet you all over Zoom. Um, that kind of comes back on you, unfortunately, um, because it, it goes straight out. It's going to be handled. The state wants to keep it within towns. I think that they're also going to encourage us and, and feel free to like stop me, Alyssa, but to sort of regionalize, especially with the smaller towns. Um, I know a couple of our other towns are starting to jump into it. Um, and then if you guys do decide to go that route, that, that will, in the long run, I think will pay off because um, that is what's gonna help you administer your flu clinics and, and whatever you decide to do going forward. And there will be there within that, that platform that is based around billing mm -hmm. to give you something, a, a little something back for the town. I know that public health is not exactly a money maker, mm -hmm. but, um, and then it will, so on the front end of it, your residents will have um, this really pretty map and they get to click on it and sign up. And I apologize, I have four children. <laughs> wow, a little bit. See, I told you they live here, Alyssa. <laughs> How do you keep them quiet during the day? School. Um, where was I? Uh, oh. Map. Map. Yeah. So that part's great. And then people have the ability to schedule, which is huge. And then the scheduling is staggered. So within that platform is built the social distancing, if you will, because, mm -hmm. and then you're able to like set up, say, four minute. Um, almost like you would a clinic mm -hmm. um, intervals with your interface with your patient. So you're expecting like your time face to face with each person for each administration for each injection would be four minutes. So say if you have five vaccinators that are doing four minute slots to get them through from door to sitting room, mm -hmm. and then you know that they're going to be sitting there for at least another 15 to 30 minutes, that will help you then on the front end load your folks in and have folks sort of do that for you mm -hmm. on the back end when everything when all the bugs are out and i think that will come because that is definitely the push the state is pushing us all towards based on the number of free trainings they're offering mm -hmm. um is the ability to enter that information from this platform directly into miis within the same day, not manually, the way that we're forced to do it now. Right mm -hmm. now, we, we manually do a spreadsheet and schedule folks and run that the way we do. And then we enter everything afterwards or while we're doing mm -hmm. it, but it's all manual. This, in theory, once the work is done up front, then you're, you're clicking through, mm -hmm. but your clinicians are able to do that. And then right. your administrator is able to quickly review everything and upload that clinic straight into MIIS. So that's that's the big goal. We are not there yet as a state, but I think that's definitely the direction. Okay. How does what you're talking about interface with the uh, what's going on, for example, over at Gillette, where you've got a facility that can you know put out 5,000 vaccinations a day? 
is, is there any way to interface with something that's got that kind of capacity so that it could actually serve a town as small as ours? Or is that still, I don't know, too many people? No, I'm not quite exactly sure what you're asking. I think right now what you're seeing at Gillette is twofold. One is, um, honestly, the vaccine is just, for whatever reason, uh, from what we're hearing, it's where we only got 80% of our supply and they're doling that out on kind of as a, like really as needed, like we asked for, I don't, I can't remember exactly how many doses, we got 60, we had to scrape those and, um, and manage to get your folks done, obviously. Um, I think what we're seeing at Gillette is twofold. One is there's just not enough supply to meet the demand. And the other side of that is the challenges of having that clinic staffed properly. Mm -hmm. um, it's also hard, uh, Alyssa, you, maybe you can speak to this as well, um, the monitoring side of it because it's a brand new vaccine and it's under EUA, I believe it's called. We can't just do it like a flu clinic where we give them a shot and say, all right, this is what you look for, bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. they have to physically sit there. So we need eyes on them. Um, and that's really hard to do <laughs> unless you've got people coming into a space. So I, I envision that Gillette will ramp up. Mm -hmm. I just don't think it's there yet for not just one reason, a myriad of reasons. And I, I think that in the scheme of things, Massachusetts is doing pretty well mm -hmm. compared to other places. I think yeah. everybody's really... Yeah, kind of not in a good place right now. That doesn't make it easier to swallow, but that's that's just kind of facts on the ground. I mean, I certainly understand that the state is looking at different groups who are going to be vaccinating people. So I guess I can understand what Tom's question is a little bit. Are are we expected as a as a community to put on vaccine clinics for our residents? Are we expecting everybody to eventually go sign up at Foxborough or other places to go get their vaccine? Do you people need help with people inputting information, you know, putting stuff into the computer? Do you need people to direct traffic? Do you need people to go, go say, sit over there? Do you need to train people to say, these are the symptoms we need to look at for people who might be having an allergic reaction to this? I'm a, I'm a veterinarian, so. Well, you, you know, know that. Yeah. I do know, and I've worked yeah. with the Medical Reserve Corps. I've, I've spoken to the people that be at the state to try to add veterinarians to the vaccine administration. We are authorized under the state, but it had to do with the board of registration and some of our liability issues. But I could load a vaccine for somebody. I could hand something to somebody. You know, so there's people out there who have some medical background who would love to assist everybody. But I don't. I don't know how that works. You obviously are seeing it from the bottom up. But but we don't know what we can do to help you either as a town or or just step back and wait till your number comes up on some list somewhere. So I I almost feel. Someone, do you mind if I jump in? No, please. Okay. So I almost feel, you know, in regards to an emergency dispensing site, we've have in the past, we've had our EDS drills mm -hmm. at the senior center. And I just don't, I, I hate to say this, but I just don't feel that if we were going to have some kind of mass vaccination clinic, I don't think that that is a good site. It's not big enough. It's not. Yeah. And, you know, I think that, I mean, the police station was a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful, but we can't have the general public right. at the police station. So, you know, I think if we're kind of going in that direction, you know, I think that we need to try to identify a, an alternate site and that would be step number one and then um you need to get on prep mod if we're going to go in that direction. mod and and that would be kind of something another thing for i hate to say it for betsy or maybe one of the board members to kind of get the <laughs> with because we we don't have that you know we've gone to the trainings but we can't go on to prep mod Mm -hmm. So unless we go on under you, exactly, at, because we're contracted through you, but we can't right. own it, so to speak. So Betsy, have you got that information on how to 
on how to apply or access it or what do we do? Um, I'm sure I do somewhere, but it's buried in a mountain of emails. So, I mean, Simone and I have attended, I don't know, three, four mm -hmm. trainings. And I mean, I, I, I am kind of tech savvy. I mean, mm -hmm. it went way, <laughs> I mean, it was just, mm -hmm. They were talking German. It was just way over my head. So I'm I, I'm gonna need someone to help wow. get trained and then you know give, give me the prep mod for dummies. And also, I just want to bring this up. If we do end up, if you guys do end up deciding that, and then so once your town administrator signs up for it, and then we we could be. Um, what is it, admin on there, correct? Right. And we do have IT at the VNA that can help us mm -hmm. on our end, um, figure some of the, like help us with the training and and figure out some of the the things on the ground. But we just, we can't go on, on under the VNA's suite. Mm -hmm. We have to go, it has to be Norfolk that decides to do this. So I'm more than willing to learn how to use the, the medical record. I, you know, I ran telemedicine services, so I've taught many people how to use tele, you know, medical records. In addition to that, I'm also an RN. So if you need help giving shots, you know, please feel free to reach out. Um, you know, I, you know, I work Monday through Friday, but I bet I could negotiate something with the hospital I work at saying, I'm doing volunteer work, you know, for the good of everybody. Um, I think for our sites, we may, one of the things we might want to look at is look at some of the churches because a lot of the churches have very large basement areas, or I know, you know, a, you know, a big space that's bigger than um, the senior center. So you could definitely, um, they all have parking. You know, I mean, I know St. Jude's is huge down, down below. Uh, I'm not sure about the Baptist church. I've never been in there. Um, the church in the center of town, the congregational church has a school attached, but also has another big, bought, big basement too. I mean, I think to be kind of thinking out of the box, the challenge that we might have on those is internet. So if we're gonna be using an electronic medical record, we have to make sure that we have the ability to um, have good internet service or, you know, is there something else that we can plug into? We can, you know, do a kind of a, uh, a landline. So that's the, uh, the challenge that I found in the past doing telemedicine is that, you know, you've got these wonderful computers on wheels and whatnot, but if your internet's not good, then you're inputting something and the whole thing crashes. So, you know, that might be something else to take a look at. So um, I don't know if like on a weekend, can we commandeer one of the schools? Cause you know, the schools have really good internet. So can you take over the middle school, for example? Um, you know, and you have a big, huge gymnasium or even, you know, the elementary school, you know, a big, huge gymnasium and you have, you know, good parking again, like that type of deal, I think for the, for the, um, a, a good site. Yeah, that's great. We also know. have, there's a, um, a, well, fairly active, was more active in the past year, but a uh, medical reserve corps in town yep. with some retired medical people, veterinarians, people who just volunteer yep. to, you know, again, assist, dry, you know, direct traffic, take exactly. names. Exactly. You know, there's, we have those people in town. That's great. And then the other thing is once, you know, once we get, once we all, you all, not me, mm -hmm. I'm just here to assist, decide which direction you're going in. Those volunteers, like one of the things the state wants us to do is when we run those clinics, again, pardon my children, <laughs> um, is make sure that we vaccinate all of our volunteers right. like they, because they are then part of that clinic. Guess what? Mm -hmm they get part of that shot. So, I mean, we were very, very, we ran that, that EMS drill for the first responders super tight and we had um, our nurses there and we actually, because we couldn't get as many doses as we really wanted and we wanted to make sure that every single first responder that showed up got, it, got an injection. Then some of our nurses, Alyssa and I included, were like, "Yeah, we're not. We're just going to hold off until we get our our guys done here." And and ladies, and forgive me, I'm old, so I tend to misspeak gender-wise. But um, 
Yeah. So that that's just something to think about that way. A way to get more folks in the community mm -hmm. vaccinated is if they volunteer to help us run a clinic and we run it according to this EMS drill, then we're mm -hmm. all sort of covered. And then we can file our site plan and hopefully get some funding to cover some of the, the cost of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. One thing I um, just wanted to say that um, I know a lot of towns are using their polling places as their vaccination um, sites. So uh, Freeman, the Freeman Kennedy School would be, is our polling place. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Yeah, that's a, and that's a big area that you could literally have it kind of flowing in that people would check in. You'd had a whole section for immunization and then you could have a section in the back to have people watched. Yeah, that's how we set it up at um, the, at the uh, police station. Yes. Yeah. And we do actually have our, um, we have our clinic set up for um, them to get their second doses. Okay. Again, if you need extra hands to give injections, please let me know. Thank you. Well, yeah, do keep in mind, uh, as Eileen has said, uh, we have able uh, volunteers not, not very far away who mm -hmm. uh, can certainly help out in many different parts yeah. of, of yeah. the whole process. Uh, and thank you, Cheryl, for volunteering your weekends. Uh, <laughs> I have no so, place to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually had a couple of medical, uh, a doctor and um, another RN reach out to me offering yeah. as well. So. So, so what what is next? We, we have um, right now we're in the stage of working with first responders. Um, have the um, the nursing home staff been vaccinated yet? We don't have any nursing homes. So we I don't have nursing homes now. They started, um, they started this past weekend. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, <laughs> My Siri started talking to me. Oh. They, started, <laughs> they they. Oh, God. Well, we can't hear her, so. Okay. Um, they started this past weekend. Okay. And then after that, <laughs> when, when do uh, we get involved again as a town? In phase terms of next two? Is it phase yeah, two? Yeah, phase two. All right. And, and that would be seniors like 75 and older? Seniors, yep. All right. Um, which can be even in our town, which isn't that large, but we have a fair number of older folk. I'm getting really close to that group. Um, so for that group, um, we would need a facility, probably something like the Freeman Centennial, I would guess, um, to be able to get that whole group inoculated reasonably quickly. Um, I'm just trying to get a handle of whether this is something where more, most towns are going to be handling phase two as individual towns, or are they still going to be gathering into larger clusters? We, don't, we don't know. Mm -hmm. I, they were still, the, the state is still kind of talking to us about um, phase one. And quite honestly, um, they're kind of, saying to us on these DPH calls that, you know, if you're going to be, you know, making the commitment to vaccinate for phase two, then you need to vaccinate for phase three, then you're in it for the long haul. Mm -hmm. As you're, well, so there's no real decision then made as to whether there's gonna be a large number of even, uh, you know, pharmacies, for example, that are just having people walk in and take a, and getting a shot versus having these multi thousands per day, you know, large centers like Gillette operating as the major, you know, point for people to be injected. I'm just kind of curious what the, if, there, if there's a plan for dealing with these very, very large, I mean, I, there's some horror stories come out of places like Florida right now, where you see these lines of people you know, 75 and 80 years old, sitting in their cars for hours and hours and hours. And, and that is certainly not the way to organize anything. And so how, how do we avoid that and create something which in fact um, 
is respectful of the people that are being in, injected, first of all, and efficient. Well, I think if you're, you know, doing scheduled appointments, that's the big thing. Down in Florida, it's like a first come, first serve. And they've told them, bring your meals, bring your meds, because you may be there for hours upon hours. So I think if, you know, we can get the scheduling platform up and running, it makes it so much easier. I think the challenge, though, is some of our elderly may or may not have computer access. So how do we deal with that? So do we have them call a certain number <clears throat> and have people man that number so they can put them in the into the system or you know that type of deal and you know maybe the reserve court might be a great you know they can call every day between the hours of you know x and y and have somebody from the reserve court that answers that phone so you know poor betsy's not you know drowned with all the phone calls and then you can then plug them into this the schedule at that point in time and i think if you do something like that and have it so everyone's scheduled. I mean, that's how the hospital I work at is doing it. It's absolutely incredible. If you're up to, they, they've staggered who gets the, the vaccine, we get an email saying, it's your turn, call this number, you call the number, you make the appointment, you go down, you, you're greeted by somebody who hands you the card, gives you all the information, you fill out your card, then you walk down, somebody puts you into the computer to make sure you're in there, and then you go get your shot. And then after you get your shot, you go sit down. And actually, before you go sit down, somebody grabs you and makes the appointment for your next shot. And then you go sit down for the 15 to 30 minutes, and then you're free. So it's a, a really nice workflow. And I think if you, we do something that models like that would be a, a great idea. Again, having everybody, you know, the appointments. And I think the important thing is to let people know if your appointment's at 920, then, you know, don't get there at nine o'clock. You know, mm -hmm. you can, you, you know, you get here at, at, at 915. The other thing is, do you want to have somebody with a phone that people call and say, hi, I'm Cheryl, I have a 920, I'm here. And someone goes, okay, you can come in now versus having everybody just kind of, you know, like when you go to the hairdresser, they, they make you come in or the doctor's office. Yeah. Well, something like what you're describing, I think is what we'd love to have. Mm -hmm. The question is, how do you organize all of that so that it really does work and you don't have people trying to call and there's, you know, well, they can't get through, for example, because everybody's calling at the same time. Mm -hmm. You need some kind of a system for the whole spreading out of the, of the, the workload mm -hmm. so that you don't have this meltdown and uh, systems breaking down and people just showing up because they can't get through to make a reservation on their own. Um, which is what that's where prep mods going to come in mm -hmm. in theory yeah and i think we could probably reach out to sherry too um they they probably have a list of the at-risk seniors mm -hmm. and michelle paladini she would know mm -hmm. Yeah, and Are maybe those somebody calls and schedules them up front. Yep. Well, if it's done alphabetically, for example, if you're in a certain age group and your last name begins with whatever the letter is, mm -hmm. then, you, then you know <laughs> that, that, you know, yep. no, no sense calling today because you're not going to be on the list. Um, I thought that, that was category. a great idea. I couldn't understand why Florida didn't do something like that. You're over 65, your last name begins with A. You yeah. know, and you start with that. I, yeah, the whole free for all thing was bizarre to me. Um, it's Florida. Yeah. Are there online classes that people? That's what that's what my husband says. Um, are there actually any online, you know, training classes for people who would be helping conduct a clinic that that some that we could take? Would that be? Are there are there that resource? Would that be helpful? So there's. Stuff that you can take through um, the ICS, you've taken the ICS, NIP, oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. the emergency prepared. Mm -hmm. to the mass DPH or anything. Yeah. No. Okay. No, no. Um, one thing I was just thinking of, um, some doctor's offices, I believe, are going to be able to complete the MCVP agreement through the state. Mm -hmm. And as long as they have the storage capability, we'll be able to order mm -hmm. vaccine for their patients, patient populations. Mm -hmm. um, they mentioned something that if they were affiliated with a larger hospital, um, they could obtain the vaccine for their patients that way. So I think that there's going to be, um, hopefully, fingers crossed, 
um, a little bit more availability um, in the coming phases. And I hate to be so gray with everything, but I just, that's just kind of where we are. What about Wal uh, Walgreens in town? Would we be able to ask them to help or to store or? I reached out to um, both Walgreens and CVS. Mm -hmm. um, didn't really have very much luck with Walgreens. Um, just a, a response to read their SOP on their on their website for what they're doing with the vaccine. Um, a little bit better with CVS, but I think that everybody's so inundated right now that they're just trying to get through phase one. So I think I was gonna try to reach out maybe in a couple weeks. I have a contact over at CVS, the territory manager, um, and see if there's something that we can do. I think CVS is getting some vaccines is what I read. So, but not Walgreens. I didn't read anything about Walgreens. So you, you're probably right. I, I don't have a chance to read anything. Yeah. <laughs> so in terms of next steps, uh, in terms of vaccination, there, there are things we got to talk about. Um, from your your views from the ground up, Alyssa and Simone, what, what is what's next? Is, is from the town board of health perspective, in terms of vaccination, is there anything coming up between now and the middle of February? I think if you guys can get um, prep mod, mm -hmm. that would be. Amazing. We can be amazing. Eileen <laughs> is writing it down. <laughs> we can be amazing. Um, you know, if if you guys are interested in in trying to vaccinate us too, mm -hmm. um, if we could possibly take a look at the different sites, I think Freeman Kennedy would probably be uh, preferred over the church. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen the church, but. Mm -hmm. I just think in in regards to flow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, because you can go in and out. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think Donna Jones has a question. Thank you. Um, do we have group homes in town? Are they congregate living? Although they're not a nursing home. They used to be. Yeah, I believe we do. I believe we do. Just yeah. Cleveland Street, Main Street yeah. near Park. Mm -hmm. There's one on North North Street, one on Maple Street as well, I believe. And group homes are considered congregant settings. So do, do we contact them or do they contact us in terms of getting vaccinated? Or who's in charge of those group homes? Are they privately run or are they run by the state hmea is one of them the horace man group which has multiple locations hold on i can check yeah, no one's no one's contacted us and it would be unrealistic to think that we could contact them because we wouldn't know who to contact So, so Donna, what I can tell you, um, you know, like as Betsy just said, um, you know, nobody has contacted us and some of the other communities that we cover, um, we have been contacted by um, the um, directors of the group homes and, um, and during my conversations, um, the directors have just decided to have um, to to go to uh, the first responder clinics for their um, employees and um, try to work out other means for um, the residents at this time. That's what during our conversations. That's what the director, one director that I spoke with, said. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
somewhat analogous to that. Um, are, are all the, uh, the inmates in like MCA Norfolk, are they all being in, in vaccinated right now too? That would not be, I mean, that's, that's through the prison system, but they right. should be getting vaccinated. Yep. Yeah. I had the impression that they were in this population that at this stage of the inoculation yeah. process. Yes. Yeah. yeah, which kind of brings us up to another topic <laughs> we, we need to talk about. Um, is there anything else about vaccination at this point? So next steps, pre-mod uh, or prep-mod. Prep-mod, yeah. Um, so who's taking that on? So Thanks, if, if you can find that information and then we can figure out how to get it onto the system. I'm more than happy to work with you on it. And then once we can log onto the system and figure out how to give people usernames and passwords and stuff like that, you know, we can be, have administrators and put Alyssa and Simone on it also. So I just forwarded you all a, um, the three of you, uh, an email from Ron O'Connor from DPH on um, some trainings and things like that. Okay. Oh, great. Thanks, Betsy. Thanks, Betsy. Um, okay. Did we need to talk about the King Philip Regional School District quarantine requirement discussion? Yeah, that's on the list. Um, actually, there, there, there are several things. I, I had a conversation with uh, one of our selectmen over the weekend, Kevin Kalka, and uh, actually the part that I was leading up to a, a minute ago had to do with the prisons and the way the data from the prisons kind of gets folded into the Norfolk mm -hmm. data and therefore makes our life very complicated in, in terms mm -hmm. of trying to unfold it so that we can figure out what's the general population infection rate versus what's the prisoner and officer infection rate within the walls. And after talking to Kevin and doing a little bit of digging, I it turned to be a, ought to be a very frustrating thing to try to essentially separate the, those two data sets because there, there, were, there was a week, for example, somewhere in December where there were more people infected in the prisons than were infected in the town, which doesn't make any sense because they all get counted. So there, there is some problems with the data we're working with, but beyond that, um, for a while, it seemed as if the prisons were basically driving an awful lot of the data being reported for the town of Norfolk. That was certainly true in November, and early December. It seems as though now in January, the data that I've, I've seen so far, and Alyssa, you, you see this data even faster than the rest of us, it seems as if the number of infections showing up in the town of Norfolk can't be explained by what's going on in the prisons. So those numbers in January especially are much, much lower than they have been. And so when you see numbers like 30 per week and 60 per week, that's us, that's, that's not the prison. Um, which is obviously very disappointing. We're, we're getting a lot of transmission within the town, which brings us back to, all right, what can we do as a board to try to bring that under control if there's anything we can do? But it's, yeah, it, it's not good right now. And it doesn't show any signs of getting better. Any, any responses to that or thoughts about it? I mean, it's not good anywhere. I mean, the, we see the numbers. I, I mean, when we when we talk to people, unfortunately, I mean, people. I, I think that everybody has a lot of COVID fatigue. Mm -hmm. Quite honestly, yeah. um, over the holidays, you know, I mean, the governor said, you know, not to get together with with family and loved ones, but people were. Yeah not listening to yeah. to him and you know even just having a small get together people were doing that and people are getting sick and we're seeing a lot of household transmission mm -hmm. so you know i mean other than locking people into their homes i just don't know what <laughs> i'm bad joke but i just i just um we can't people know what what they should be doing and um, 
I, I'm not really sure what else we can we and can. The other do. thing that I think that kind of saved us over the summer, frankly, is that we could all be outside. Right. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Now we've got the weather and the fact that we don't quite, even what, 10 months in, we don't quite know how this thing transmits. I mean, we can all see that just based on hockey rinks. Mm -hmm. Why is it that you just show up in a hockey rink and you've been exposed? Um, there is definitely something going on with the way, and I think that, that, that the other strain is making its way here and, and it's made its way I think in the beginning, because of our testing shortage, we we saw um, reflected in our numbers. Um, we only tested those that we were for sure, for sure, for sure mm -hmm. they were in the hospital, and they were, um, you know, there are older people that were more at risk. And then now, I, and I think that it was still going through the population more than we realized. But now mm -hmm. our testing is is ramped up in that. You know, our kids, even though we think that there's no school transmission, there is. Um, our teenagers are definitely not following the rules. I, as you could hear earlier, mm -hmm. um, I have a few of those myself. So I, I understand where everyone's coming from. I don't see it getting better in the, in the short run. I really don't, unfortunately. And I, it comes down to personal responsibility, I think, on some level. And I, you know, how much can you enforce that? We're, you know, on the whole, we're not Arizona yet, right? Not California. Not California. I know um, <laughs> for the hospital. So what we're, we're thinking is, you know, when we had that big, huge spike in April and then it kind of came down. And what they're thinking is what we're going to do is we're going to have another peak, but it's not going to be as high as April, but it's going to be longer. Longer. Yep. Much longer. So, you know, we're still going to be able to do some surgeries and whatnot. It's not going to take over the hospitals like it did in April when it was all COVID. But we're going to be in this mess for a longer period of time. And I agree. I think people are just really just they've had enough of, of wearing masks, not being with people. They just want to be with people and they all figured, well, Christmas time, it's OK. And and again, like on the summertime, you're outside. So you, you could maintain that six feet or or the airflow through. But when you're in a house with a bunch of people and you can't stay six feet apart, it's very challenging. And the other thing that I think is going to come into play is uh, we need to push a lot of public education. I know you guys have a great public website, mm -hmm. which is wonderful, by the way, hats, hats off. <laughs> um, but just with, uh, I think for me, it would be important to stress that this vaccine, and you guys all know this, it's, it's going to be kind of like the flu vaccine, mm -hmm. I, I think, in the sense that, sure, you might not get as bad of a case, but we don't know that you just because you get the vaccine, it doesn't mean that you, you have a free pass. And if you get re-exposed to COVID and you're out of that 90 day window, even if you've been vaccinated, guess what? You still have to quarantine. You could get sick again, just mm -hmm. like as this goes on and the strains mutate like the flu, you know, it's not, it's not a free pass. So there's, yeah, people are tired. The whole mm -hmm. masking and social distancing, we are a long way out from changing that. And I right. think that the winter months are going to take our, it's told based on environment. Right. Yeah. But what I find kind of frustrating is, is that as you walk around town uh, and go into places um, like Walgreens, for example, or any of the establishments in the town, um, you know, it seems as if the folks in, in Norfolk at least the ones that are shopping, are, are really being conscientious about wearing a face mask and trying to, you know, maintain separation. I, I'm not seeing an awful lot of flagrant abuse or ignoring of uh, what people have been told is what you need to do to control this thing. Um, you know, over at the, the transfer station, you know, the sign is up, it warns people that if they're coming in there, they got to have a mask on, and they, and they are. And and so it's a bit frustrating to see, at least on the surface anyway, people behaving the way you'd like them to. But then apparently when they get inside their own homes and, and or start hanging out with their friends, all of a sudden 
there's a whole another uh, mode of operation that sets in and transmission is happening. I mean, when you get numbers like 30 and 60 per week in a town as small as ours, that's a lot of community transmission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you look at, I was just at Brothers Market last week and there was some guy with his mask here and the person behind the counter said, please put your mask up. He did, he grumbled. He walked away, put his mask back down. And I said to him, you do realize that it doesn't work under your nose. I said, you need to put it over your nose. And he like grumbled something that was probably obscene and walked away. But he was a 20 something year old. And it was, you just want to say to people, do you understand how it's transmitted? And if you know, yeah, you're covering your mouth, that's great, but it's really transmitted through your nose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think everyone's, I think everyone's got fatigue and they, people don't like being alone. People don't like not being with their friends and, you know. Yeah. So I don't, I don't hear any solutions then. <laughs> we're gonna to have to just ride this out. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh -huh. and. It, until we have it that everybody has to wear a mask and we use science and everybody gets to agree with it, we're not going to get into a better spot. The problem is, is that we have a lot of naysayers and we have a lot of people supporting the naysayers and therefore it's not going to affect me. So it's not a big deal. So I think that's the challenge. And it's those people that it's not going to affect me. I'm healthy. That may actually be the carriers. So they may hang out with their friends they get it from somebody, they have maybe minor symptoms or even symptoms they don't even know, but then they go visit grandma and then grandma gets it and she's in the hospital. So that's, you know, and until that happens, there's so many stories of people saying, I didn't think it was real until I got it. And like, why are we making this up? Why are we, you know, but there are people out there that think this is just, just a flu, yeah. not a big deal. Yeah, well. After tomorrow, naysayer number one is not going to be around quite so much. So maybe maybe things will begin to become sane. Right. Let us hope. Let's hope. Um, you know, I can tell you masks work. Another one of my staff members um, tested. She came down with symptoms. Her husband works in a police department. He got it, brought it home. She got it. We worked across the surgery table all day together. She said, I feel sweaty. I said, oh, it's just hormones. Um, turned out it wasn't just hormones, um, but everybody's wearing a mask in our, you know, we work and nobody else got it. We, a bunch of us got tested that had been in contact with her. So masks work. They yes. really, they really yes. do. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, a, a new day is about to dawn. Maybe, maybe, maybe the word will get out a little more effectively that people just need to think about what they're doing a little more and wear their mask a little more <laughs> and wear it over their nose and <laughs> um, We do have some other things to talk about. Um, in fact, Eileen, you're, you're bringing up the issue of KP and um, something else which I think Alyssa probably is aware of, and maybe Simone as well, and that is quarantining and the length of time people should be quarantining. Um, if they've been exposed to um, someone who was infected, for example, um, I think the complication is there, there, are, there are different signals being sent by different organizations here. I mean, the CDC a few weeks ago came up with a somewhat different sounding regulation than what they've been going with for months and months. And then the state, when I went to the state website, maybe there's other stuff that's available, but the one that I saw said, well, there are three options here when it comes to quarantining. And so it almost seemed like, well, pick your option. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. but, but that, then, you know, what do we do as a board? We, if you take a look at those options data, you know, it's very clear that 14 days gives you a pretty high level of protection. Mm -hmm. If you get down to seven days or eight days, all of a sudden, that level of protection is more like 95% of where it was when you were contemplating 14 days. Well, all right. So what do we do as a town when we have this uproar, which I think is what Eileen was referring to, mm -hmm. of especially it seems to me to be parents of student athletes. Now, maybe I'm it's oversimplifying, but I'm seeing nodding of heads here. So maybe I'm not oversimplifying. Um, when everybody else is saying, but wait a minute, wait a minute, the CDC says this, why are you guys saying that? 
So who, who wants to take a first crack at this? Alyssa, go for it. I will take the first crack here. Okay, so we actually had um, a meeting early in December with school admin, KPE school admin, myself, the Rentham public health nurses, um, and we sent out a letter, I think it was on 12-6, that was our original documentation, um, mandating the 14-day quarantine mm -hmm. for close contacts because um, we were seeing a steady increase in cases um, across the region, and we know and we still know that the 14 day quarantine is maximum risk reduction. Okay. And then we said at that meeting, you know, we're going to revisit it. Mm -hmm. So um, we revisited just after New Year's um, and sent out additional document, an additional letter to the region on 1 7 saying, we're going to keep the 14 day quarantine. Um, we understand that this is really tough on families. Um, but right now, the numbers kind of speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. We're in the post holiday surge. This week, I believe is 21 days from the holidays where we're going to see kind of like the peak of that. And, you know, we said in the meeting that we would be happy to revisit once we see a steady decrease in the cases. Right now, we're in the red. We kind of just, I, I understand that this is not ideal. I completely understand I have a family but you know, we just need to do our part mm -hmm. and we just, we're trying to keep, our ultimate goal is to keep the schools open and to keep them safe. And in order for us to do that, again, I'm gonna go back to the maximum risk reduction, which is the 14 day quarantine for students and staff. I hear you saying that as, as, as long as the numbers are continuing to go up, we cannot be relaxing. Mm -hmm. our criteria for protecting the spread or stopping the spread. Yeah, Simone, yeah. And yep. I'm Go ahead. gonna agree with Alyssa. And the other thing I would like to just throw in there is that, so we get to see some of the things that maybe other folks don't get to see. There's a lot of transmission in sports, a mm -hmm. lot. And so, um, and this, I will, I will say that there, the school transmission probably isn't as high as it could be, mainly because we've got all these rules in place. Yep. And when the kids are in school, they are policed very, very consistently by their teachers. There's seating charts. I mean, it, it is, it's literally down to a science. And even with that, even, and we cover, you know, several towns, even in towns that thought they could never have in-school transmission because they are amazing, they've got it, like it or not. And there, we see consistently it go through a family and there are many people that unfortunately it's, and it happens more in the, in the kids, they are carriers and don't even, they don't realize it. Yeah. So I, I, I have four kids, you guys heard them, I'm ready to kill them myself. I just stuck them in the barn, which may or may not be heated at this point. But um, it's, it's uh, we're trying to base, I, I think, again, now what you guys decide to do as a town is your call mm -hmm. for sure. Um, but I think the school made a decision based on the numbers, the town transmission, and the fact that the pressure has been sent down from up top, mm -hmm. APH and DESE, which is, okay, we're gonna give you all these options to follow, but we want schools to stay open. Mm -hmm. And the more in-person learning that we can have, the better it is for the kids. So, uh, you know, that, that's where I, I come down on that. It's it's up to you guys ultimately. But I think the what I'm understanding is that this was made by three towns, the region. 
So it's not just Norfolk on their own. Yeah, and, and just to speak to what you were saying, it's, you know, from a, from a contact tracing perspective, to have the region, you know, as a uniform force with this court 14 day mm -hmm. quarantine makes a little bit more sense, especially on part for the school nurses. Um, because if you have, you know, a sibling who goes to KP and then you have their younger sibling go to school, you know, at Freeman Kennedy. Um, and then, you know, if, and, and again, Norfolk can decide to do whatever they want to do, but if, you know, Norfolk in the end decided to go along with what DPH is doing for quarantine and- um, I might add, let me just jump in there. It's still a 14 day quarantine. It is, it is. Relying on people on the honor system and monitoring and reporting and testing, which is not happening. Right. So if, if they decided to use that test out option, then it would just, at that point, you know, families, I think, would, it would kind of, they would be confused because they would say, well, how come Johnny is in, is in quarantine for 14 days and Sally can use this test out option? Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. That's why we, we decided as a region, we would implement the 14 day quarantine while we had this increase in numbers and then again, revisit. And when we revisit, hopefully every month, maybe we'll see a decrease in numbers and we'll say, okay, at this point, we feel like it's safe mm -hmm. to kind of pull back. But right now we just can't. Yeah. All right. What's the, what's the, Sorry, what's the definition of the close contact? I think that some people were having issues with that, especially, you know, on the sports team, because my kids over here and your kids over there. And, you know, so what's the what's the definition of close contact in in you know those types of sports? Is it obviously it's is it different, any different than anybody else's close contact? It depends on the sport. Okay. Yeah. So if you're um playing hockey. It would be if you're in a hockey game. It would be anybody on the on the ice. Um, if you're playing soccer, anybody on the ice. Yeah, if you're playing soccer, we would be able to try to identify the um, the the individual who is the positive case, and through you know trying to see okay who was playing against this individual, who was within six feet of this individual. It, it, it's a it's not a cut and dry answer. It depends. Okay. It one might of have been some of the things that was given. I'll just share this with you. And um, and one of the things we could also do if it's helpful is send you guys out the Maven. So the DPH puts out its public information and it's all these source documents that are wonderful and just sort of go through things point by point. But one of the things that the sports epis explained to me very clearly was they it's brand new virus, as you know, right? It's brand new in the, in the world of epidemiology. And there is something going on with transmission over the cool, dry air of the ice. That's different from whatever happened with baseball. Um, and it seems like even basketball, I haven't seen as many positive cases in my experience thus far come out as, as hockey has just been. Hockey's, hockey, yeah, you have very hot. It, hockey is hot. very, yeah, hockey is hot. <laughs> Interesting. All right. Um, Eileen, were you going to say something to add your own medical? No, I was just curious about kind of the different sports and how, what the close contact was, because that seemed to be where the parents were uh, complaining most was, you know, maybe it did differ from sport to sport. Maybe they didn't understand why you know, and what that definition, you know, again, my kid was over here and that kid was over there. So why is my kid, you know, in 14 day quarantine? Yeah. Well, people take, you know, things they hear and, and guidelines they hear very literally, like, you know, it's gotta be 15 minutes and it's gotta be, you know, whatever, whatever it is. And, and we say, well, heck, that never happened during the game or, you know, whatever. So I can understand how some parents would be upset because they would say, well, you know, my, my 
child never was in contact with that child for 15 continuous minutes ever. So how can you possibly think there's a problem here? Well, yeah, but it's not quite that simple. Um, are, are the members of the board comfortable with the idea that as we are seeing for the last couple of weeks, especially the numbers going in very dramatically the wrong direction, that we continue with the maximum level of, let's say, protection against community transmission, at least until we have some more data to suggest that we can relax those regulations a little bit. So between now and our meeting in February, we're gonna leave it at 14. Is that something? I agree. And I think for the fact that Alyssa and her group, that they're meeting with the other towns, I think it's important too, to have everybody on the same page. So, you know, I think if Norfolk wants to change something, we need to be in the same step as Rentham and Plainville, because again, you may have kids in elementary, you may have, and then, you know, is it a Rentham kid, but it's a Norfolk school. So they're in the middle school, or if it's a Plainville kid in the Rentham school and we have everything. I think we need to have consistency amongst the three towns also. So to have that, if we make a recommendation that we relax it, then it should go to the other boards of health too um, and have it the discussion with the, the, the public health nurses and the school nurses uh, and that group to say, yes, that's an appropriate thing to do. I see some other people who are listening to us this, this evening. Uh, does anybody who is currently connected to this conversation wish to say anything? Betsy, do you, do you have some control over people who are around you? Uh, yep, there's no comment. Okay, all right. Um, well, mm -hmm. I, we're gonna continue with the policy that's already in place. I guess there's no necessarily a reason to make a motion or if anybody wishes to make a motion to continue the current policy, at least for the next month. Go ahead and do so. <laughs> I, I make a motion that we continue with the current school district school sports quarantine requirements until we decide otherwise on the advice of our public health nurses and in conjunction with the uh, town of Rentham and the town of Plainville. A second. Good. Well spoken, ma'am. Uh, all, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. All right, on the list of COVID issues, um, are there others? From the field? Actually, you're all from the field. <laughs> I'm not the only one staying at home these days. Um, is that it then? Is there anything else to talk about tonight? New business. Uh, we have a schedule of third Tuesdays that have been proposed all the way through to the end of the year, actually. I, so didn't get my I have a request. So um, I've been asked to join the vestry on my church again. And the last time I did that, I actually had dropped off the board of health so I could do the vestry. Um, mm -hmm. And now that I realized it was always on the third Tuesday of, or, of the month. So I'm wondering if um, it's okay to change the board of health meeting if you guys are uh, amenable to that to a different day. Okay. Like I said, I'm on home all the time, so I don't care. <laughs> How about you? The, the only day that's probably a problem for me is, is Wednesdays, because that's my late night, so I can't do Wednesdays, but I could do pretty much any other evening of the week. Okay. I have to know in advance, that's all. Yeah. Hey, Betsy, what about the second Tuesday? Um, no, I've got planning board that night. Planning board. Uh, I know that because my other member goes to those. Uh, all right. Uh, when when does the planning board meet? Only on the second Tuesday or the twice second a month? Tuesday. Second. All Would it right. be possible the fourth Tuesday? Yeah, the fourth Tuesday. Works for me. Fourth Tuesday. Mm -hmm. it might be Thanksgiving for all I know. I'm not sure. Or not Tuesday. It wouldn't be that week. Um, okay. Tuesday. All right, you want to go for the fourth Tuesday, folks, for right now? And of course, this is a little subject to change. Yeah. 
Sure. So that would put us at the next uh, meeting would be February 23rd. Right. Okay. Um, Tom, I have a message from uh, Jill Lawrence, who mm -hmm. is on um, with us tonight. She writes, as a KP parent, I am concerned that the 14-day close contact quarantine policy negatively affects student learning and mental health by keeping them in their bedrooms, sometimes unnecessarily. Could that policy definitely be rediscussed prominently at your February meeting? We certainly promise to take it up. Um, what we said we're going to be doing here is an attempt anyway at data-driven decision-making so that if the data suggests by that time mm -hmm. that we can afford to relax a bit, we can certainly consider it at that time. I think that's something we should at least have on the agenda right now. We may decide, well, the data doesn't support changing it at this time, but we will certainly take a look at it so we can promise Ms. Lawrence that that's the case. Okay. I said thank you. Anything else? Um, there was just a note on here about the Southwood Community Forum on January 26th at 7 p.m. So uh, that's about to do the Southwood uh, property and um, what's going to be happening, hopefully, if that gets purchased by. Um, a company who is willing to clean up the toxic waste site uh, and develop things. Is this the one that involved a lot of trucks? Yes. It is possible. It does um, include a lot of trucks. The property is about 86 acres. So they, you know, maybe putting up some kind of, you know, last mile type warehouse, but that's not necessarily, you know, in etched in stone. But there are other things that could potentially be going on um, at that property that would really benefit the town in, in many different ways. So I think it'll be interesting to hear what they have to say, especially cleaning up the toxic waste from the Caritas Hospital. Um, you know, that. It's actually from the, the state. One. The toxic waste is actually from the state when it was a, a cancer hospital. Caritas inherited that and then. The rest is history, but and actually, right. it, it was they were supposed to. The state was supposed to clean it up when they they sold it to Caritas, and that never happened. I didn't realize that. That's I. That's interesting. I didn't realize that at all. It was it was when it was this when it was originally Pondville Hospital. It was a state run cancer facility, and mm -hmm. um, a lot of the toxicity is from that. There's just stuff buried everywhere, and there were oil leaks too. It's yep. just a really nasty site. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, the, the, getting it cleaned up would be a great idea. The, the only issue of, from what I've heard is there are some people concerned about what it's going to look like when they've all done the new, the new version of it. Mm -hmm. But anyway, 26, that's coming up. Yep. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'll, anything I'll, else? I'll email, you the, I'll email you all the Zoom link if you'd like to attend. Thank you. OK. There is a description of the meeting on the town website. Will the Zoom link come out later? Uh, the Zoom link should be on that meeting posting on the um, My Town Government. Okay, okay, I'll go back and look at that. Just on the Norfolk MA US, it just says save the date for the forum. No, if you look at the town calendar, I posted the meeting there. The Zoom link should be um, there as well, Donna. Thank you. Just double check that too. All right, folks. Um, thank you all for a, a very uh, informative discussion and uh, keep up the good work. Yes, thank you guys. Thank you very much for all the work you do. Thank you much. Guys, I just have to say what a wonderful first responder team you have it was such a pleasure to do that clinic that was like one of those moments you have a few of those when you're a nurse sometimes it's thankless but that was one of those days where i just we were all in my whole house grinning from ear to ear so thank you thank you for good group thank you for your all your help yes 
Thank you, guys. All right, folks. See you next month, if not sooner. We have to make a motion to uh, adjourn. Your second. Uh, I second the motion to adjourn. <laughs> all right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Good night, all. Bye. Bye. <laughs>